One of the perks of being a bishop is that you can ask people to, to pray for things. So if I may ask you kindly to uh, remember my mother during this Mass. She died on this day 10 years ago, so today is her 10th anniversary. Uh, if you would be so kind as to, to pray for her. And so um, we, we may pray that uh, uh, she may rest in peace and the souls of all the faithful departed rest in peace. And we will be remembering the faithful departed, especially tomorrow. Well, uh, you will have noticed that all three readings tonight for this great solemnity are from the New Testament, nothing from the Old. And this is a sign that we are in some way uh, in Eastertide today, that today is an Easter, because in Easter, at Eastertide, during the 50 days of Easter, the church only reads from the New Testament. So that's a clue just in what we read today that we are celebrating the resurrection of Christ. We are celebrating the victory of Christ over the power of sin and death. We're celebrating that not just in his own person, in his own a human body and soul, but in the whole body of the redeemed, in the spirits and souls of the just with him in heaven. So all saints is like the detonation of the power of Christ's cross and resurrection. It's the spirit of Pentecost filling humanity. It's rather like, well, this time of year, fireworks, a single firework goes up and then goes bang in the sky and there's a multitude of colors and sparks and lights. So it is. After that, I, John, saw a great crowd, impossible to count, of people from every nation, race, tribe, and language. So this is a feast of Christ risen in the form of the church triumphant, the church in heaven, the saints. In some of the Eastern liturgies, all the martyrs, all saints are commemorated on the Friday after Easter, the Friday after Easter, very close. Uh, in other Eastern liturgies, the Feast of All Saints falls on the Sunday after Pentecost, after, immediately after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes and the result is holy people. And for us, All Saints comes towards the close of the year when the leaves are falling. So after the coming of the Holy Spirit, after many saints' days, after the solemnity of Mary's Assumption into heaven, comes this great gathering together of all the redeemed. And this just before the feast of Christ the King and the anticipation of his returning glory at the beginning of Advent. So just where these feasts are kept is like a great lesson, great teaching just in that. There's great artistry in the liturgical year. It's a very beautiful piece of architecture, you might say. Well, one spring day, we imagine it as a spring day in Galilee, Jesus, the Son of God, saw a great crowd, fishermen and farmers, women and children. And he went up a hill and sat there with the good earth as his throne. And he gave them the Beatitudes. He gave us the Beatitudes. This was the gospel we've just heard. He's given the whole of human history, all who have ears to hear these eight Beatitudes, the way to heaven. He sowed them, if you like, these extraordinary sayings, blessed are the poor in spirit, and so forth. He sowed these in the soil of history. And now he is seated in the glory of the Father, and he sees this other, greater, expanded crowd, the crowd impossible to count. He sees the harvest. He sees the poor in spirit, the gentle, those who mourned, who hungered and thirsted for the right. He sees the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted. He sees all in whom his words have come true, have, have become flesh, you might say, have formed lives and hearts. 
and he, still the mediator, takes up their praise and their joy and offers it to his Father. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever. Amen. It's extraordinary to think that behind the veil, as it were, all this is happening now. Well, tonight then, light falls on us. It falls on us from the hill of the Beatitudes by the Lake of Galilee. It falls on us from the heavenly Jerusalem. And what does it show? What does it say? What is this, the light that shines tonight? Surely it answers our age-old question, why is there anything at all? Why neutrons and protons and electrons? Why this material world? Why animals? Why us humans? Why is life the way it is? Why so many contradictions? The answer is, so there may be saints. So we may be saints. Holiness is the goal of it all. Holiness is why, out of the world's complexity, a being was born, the human being, capable of understanding and judging and choosing, capable of doing good, of making a gift of himself, created in the image and likeness of God. We're not created in the image of God's omnipotence or, or his omniscience, but in the image of his wisdom and goodness and freedom, in the image of his merciful love. So we are called to be saints, to reflect him, the Holy One. I think often we have a very poor notion of holiness, uh, something tinselly or unreal. But to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and strength, to love our neighbor in some way as Christ loved them, that's not unreal. St. Peter and St. Paul weren't unreal. St. John Paul and Teresa of Calcutta weren't unreal. To be poor in spirit, gentle, merciful, peacemakers, and the rest. This isn't unreal. We've met people who do this. We know people who do this. Nor is it as far away from us as we sometimes like to think. And everything, everything that happens, good, bad, or indifferent, can be grist to this mill, can bring us closer to God. Tonight reminds us why we are here, why we exist. Well, behind me on the bus recently, there were two chatting not-so-young ladies, and one was clearly a great reader of the Bible. And she said, I didn't like Revelations, though. And she said, I've read it three or four times, but I didn't like it. Well, our first reading was from the book of Revelation, the apocalypse as we call it. And I think there is something we can like in it. What, sorry, wait, cries a voice to the devastating angels. We heard that. Wait before you do any damage on land or at sea or to the trees. Wait till God's servants are sealed on the forehead. Well, what a very comforting thing. That word, wait, said to the devastating angels. Because aren't we always under the threat of devastation? Haven't we the power now to wreak utter devastation on ourselves and the land and the sea and the trees? And even short of that, how often we are devastating places and people. Think of Aleppo. Think how often lives are inwardly and outwardly devastated by violence or abuse or neglect or personal sin. But a voice cries, wait. There's a restraining power. There's a mercy that limits evil, that holds back the flood. 
and a time and a space are opened up, a space for repentance, a time for holiness. We're given our lives. We don't know for how long, but we're given them. We're given a little freedom, and grace is always there to turn everything to good. Generation after generation, saints are born under the shade of this merciful weight. The children of God emerge from this womb. It's the patience of God, the mercy of God. This, this voice that says, wait to the devastating angels and gives us time to breathe the divine waiting, the hidden power of the risen Christ, waiting till we give our whole lives, till our hearts are pure. Come to me, says Jesus, and I will give you rest.